Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Steve Haynes. I know Steve through trauma-releasing exercises or tension-releasing exercises. Uh, he comes from background in craniosacral work, various kind of body work, interest in touch. Steve, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to chatting. So what's your life story in relation to the body? How did you get interested in this whole, this whole topic? Um, I used to work with people, well, I was an engineer and did lots of sport. I was terrible at those things. But uh, my first world of uh, entering the world of therapy was I used to work with people with mental health problems. I'm fascinated by the experience of mental health. But about that time, I got into yoga and yoga was transformative for me. Sports background, but something that helped me feel much better. I had career choices of becoming a counsellor or psychotherapist or being involved in social work, something like that. But found massage and yoga and was like a kid in a sweet shop in my late 20s, trained in a whole bunch of stuff, chiropractic, craniosacral therapy, shiatsu, and a huge amount of yoga until about 40. I'm an ex-yogi these days. Uh, but the journey very much for me is how our minds link to body and um, how can we change our experience of suffering, things like pain, anxiety, things that are typically seen as just the purview of the mind, but really working through the body to meet those. And vice versa, pain is seen as something that's just about the body. And really, for me, it's more complex than that. The bridge between mind and body for me is feeling. So all my work is around the increasing our capacity to feel. Okay, so lots in there. And um, what made you give up yoga after sort of so long doing yoga? Yeah, good question. I, uh, I'm still puzzling on that a little bit. Um, because I was uh, in Ashtangi, you know, uh, getting to the end of series one, doing that three times a week, very early mornings, and did a lot of Inyanga, got into Scaravelli. And then, and then something changed. Um, uh, I, got, I started taking up skiing. We moved to Geneva. I lost the access to good yoga teachers. I got into running, I guess, and skiing and a bit of gym work. Uh, and I found that uh, meditation, and I guess TRE replaced the space that was occupied by yoga in terms of my own personal development or stress reduction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting with practice, isn't it? Sometimes they come and go. Sometimes I think we choose practices. Sometimes our practices choose us. And it does seem that people can do something for a long time and then just one day just go, I'm not really into this or... You know, I'm really drawn to um, Sistema, Russian martial arts at the moment, for no really good reason. There's a, there's a good club and a good teacher, but there's lots of good things around me. But that's the one that I'm sort of really looking forward to in my weekly schedule. And it's just funny how things come and go sometimes. Huh? Yeah, Michael Mersnick, um, he's a big guy on neuroplasticity. He's very keen on variety. Mm. So the idea that uh, you reach a certain level of practice, but then to change up, you need a new challenge. And that might be relevant as well. Um, I certainly didn't reach the end of my yoga career, and I kind of think I'll get back to it at some stage. I've had a very chaotic life uh, the last 10, 15 years, live in Geneva. I'm two weeks Geneva, one week London, one week teaching and traveling somewhere. So also for the last 13, 14 years, that hasn't made it easy to find a good teacher and sustain a regular practice. So things like TRE, running, I can do out of a hotel or do on my own, and, and that's been relevant for sure. You know, practice is a big one, isn't it? Like just the practicalities of practice. Like, as you say, I also spend a lot of time in hotels and I found yoga much easier than Aikido, for example, because I could do yoga in a hotel, whereas I'd have to find an Aikido club. It'd have to be one I got on well with, you know, I need equipment, I need my kit. And it was like, um, sometimes those practicalities overrule the more uh, esoteric reasons. For sure. Okay, so in terms of body work then, tell us a little bit about your body work journey. So you said you did a few things there. So shiatsu, people may or may not know, craniosacral. I mean, we've had other people like Michael Kern on talking about that. But again, people may or may not know. Tell us a little bit about your, your body work journey. Uh, well, initially just the pure joy of massage. That was, uh, uh, I did an adult education course when I was in my late 20s and just loved it. Uh, and then from there, uh, from there, how to study more or get more depth. I had some shiatsu sessions and just felt great after the shiatsu sessions. And that was a three-year training. Shiatsu is based on, well, it's a Japanese energy model, but rooted in Chinese medicine. So the idea of meridians and points. Instead of sticking needles in, you use your f- 
fingers and thumbs and kind of on the floor, uh, mobilizing, stretching, really dynamic, has its own dyna- uh, diagnostic system. So three-year training, and it's sort of a complete system of thought in its own way. I guess I was never that great on feeling energy in the way that it was described. And most of my best shiatsu teachers had also gone on to study cranial work. And so I got drawn into that and very quickly found the stillness and the non-doing aspect of cranial work deeply appealing. Mm-hmm. The cranial work at its heart is the sort of, there's two paradigms in cranial work. One is that there's rhythmic phenomena in the body. So heartbeat, breathing, pulses, digestive tract, uh, sort of peristalsis, uh, flow up and down the nervous system, twitching muscles, twitching fascia. All of that comes together to sort of a coherent rhythm, and we believe that we can interact with that and it's use it to diagnose a sense of health. So that's one paradigm, that it's uh, rhythms inside a body. The second one is that uh, the presence of another human being mediated through touch can facilitate sort of self-regulation and self-healing, if you like, from within. So cranial work's a very interesting philosophy around non-doing, I think, is the heart of it for me. So it's not poking, prodding, pushing. It's about trying to create safety through touch and levering our very early experiences of touch to, you know, I think touch is a fundamental driver of brain activity. We learn touch before we learn to speak. So if we can access that, we can help people go to very deep places where things reorganize. So, yeah, that was my cranial journey that started uh, around the time I finished Shiatsu. Can I However, jump in, actually, for mostly around the sort of cranial, there's different models, right? So you talked about already like an energy model, uh, a rhythm model. Some people have more like a physiotherapy, just sort of physical model or paradigm. And there's this some, I don't know, tension between these different models of different healings. What's, what's your take on that? I mean, you sort of, you know, you already said like this, even for this one system, there's two whole paradigms that exist. Yeah, no, I mean, um, uh, I've been in many communities, yoga, shiatsu, cranial work, chiropractic. Every one of them has uh, my way of doing it versus your way of doing it. And there's been huge politics to the level of acts of parliament, actually, around the chiropractic. When all of that was being uh, set up, there's a general chiropractic council. It's a regulated mm-hmm. session. So, uh, yes, all these communities that are about holism actually are deeply fractured mm-hmm. by, as a basic state. Um, so let's just name that as a starting. So everybody thinks their way of doing it is the best. Um, I guess I'm no different from that. Well, I, I don't know. I think for me, the philosophy is really important here. I like my science, but the science doesn't really take us that many. Well, it takes us to certain great places, but a lot of physiotherapy, I read a little tweet saying that 90% of physiotherapy research doesn't prove that physiotherapy works. And that's from a very rigorous, well-defined profession. So science is great. We need to get that bit right. We need to not do the stupid things, but the philosophy is really, really important. And I think there are some big philosophical blind alleys that many professions have gone up. And I hope not to do that in my teaching, but in cranial work, yes, there are different philosophies. One of them is that there's the structural model. We need to wobble and move things. Even if we do it very gently, we're still focusing on alignment of the body. I don't believe that's that useful, really. Uh, the other is the sense of um, uh, mysticism or an attempt to use energy. Again, I don't really buy into that. I, I'm a materialist. My basic mm-hmm. philosophy is uh, of consciousness emerging from the body so mystical ways of explaining things extended consciousness models don't really work for me so what are you left with you're left with a body and uh, we all have a body for me i i believe that we start in a physical world and we have a body and we consciousness emerges within our body so let's get good at the business of being in a body and for me that's very rich i can spend a whole lifetime doing that i think meeting your body is really 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 hard Most people assume it's a given. And one of the defining things is helping people find safety in their experience of their being in a body. And my goal is really to create that through using touch. So in cranial work, there's lots of strands of mysticism and energy work. And, you know, they're interesting, coherent, like shiatsu. It's a dominant, it's a coherent package if you take on board certain paradigms. And there's some ropey old mechanics around how things work, a bit like osteopathy, chiropractic, physio. There's still an underlying belief that getting things, the structure in place is going to help people 
uh, be healthier. Again, I don't think the evidence is very good for that. So we're left with something about touch and bodies and, and finding safety in the body. And for me, that often involves understanding trauma, which is where my TRE skills come in. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna, you're, you're saying too much good stuff too soon. So I want to kind of dig into all these. We're definitely going to get to trauma, definitely going to get more to touch and to safety. So, I mean, back to the sort of energy thing. This, this People are very attached to this, I've found. Just there can be no evidence for something. And if I sometimes I say, what do you mean? Or how do I know that's the case? Or maybe they're true, you know, maybe they are something, but I say, well, how do I know? And it's it's quite fantastical sometimes. And people are really asking you to believe things that go against everything we know in science, everything that there's evidence for. And we'll often take a sort of subjective feeling and turn it into a okay, well, there because I can feel something, therefore there is a objective thing flowing through you. And I'm I'm curious, like almost like how this has become normal. In our, in our worlds of embodiment, how this has become a sort of thing that you can talk about without people thinking you're completely bonkers. Yeah, indeed. Uh, if we solve that one today, Mark, we'll be doing very well. Um, but yeah, I, well, uh, where to start? So first off, I, I think it's a third of the UK population believes in angels. So we do need to know that, that our dominant paradigm is of a higher force. Uh, you know, I grew up in a Protestant Christian community, you know, we, I went to church once a month with the Cubs, but there was still this model of, of a higher power that had um, influence. And then uh, a lot, say, let's say yoga, drawing on Indian traditions, there's still this notion of consciousness is separate from matter and that there is an extended consciousness. And if you believe in extended consciousness, then all sorts of things are possible within that. And there's a history in the UK of uh, astral traveling and uh, William Blake, who's got an exhibition going on at the moment, but you know he saw angels in the trees in Peckham Rye. How fantastic is that? <laughs> so you know it's, it, it is the dominant paradigm. I would offer it's more unusual to to be a materialist and and, and kind of struggle with extended consciousness models. But you know that's where I am, and um, and also having learned to be with the body, I'm happy for anything that helps someone feel safe. Uh -huh. uh, whether you believe consciousness sort of descends into a body or whether you believe it emerges from embodiment, there's still a body. And my goal is to help you feel safe. And maybe we can include much more in our sense of self. And maybe if there is a notion of a higher power that helps you feel more clarity in your body or helps you feel more connected, then I can support that. If your philosophies are taking you away from the body, I would offer that letting go of your body is... is um, before we can leave a body or transcend a body, we should have a body. And most people's experience of those flow moments are actually because they're deeply rooted in their body so they can expand more and include more in their sense of self rather than it being a separation. Uh -huh. So it, it's, it is a very tricky space, but most of the time I don't really need to engage with it because I just say whatever your extended notions of energy, there is a body as I'm starting with and it's useful to pay attention to it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is avoiding the conversations. Actually, the more skillful move when people are very attached to it or have some sense that I, I think it's some, often something of like I have magic powers that that kind of reeks of ego to me. You know, I'm I'm aware of and can influence something which other people aren't. And is this, yeah. this that's a sort of power move I find often in many cases. But um, you I know. think it's also a, a, a false paradigm in many alternative medicines. So I'm very fond of saying at the moment, anything can work some of the time. Nothing works all yeah. of the time. Yeah. But what are the key things that help us work? You know, I believe that if we put a safe stimulus into a system, then uh, that can generate change. And it could be anything that is the stimulus. Okay. But it's not okay. going to keep working. So that's why we need to have variety and keep helping people explore staying present in mm -hmm. creative ways. Uh -huh. And that's, you know, that comes back to our point why, you know, maybe yoga stopped working mm -hmm. for me because I needed a little bit of variety or a different way of approaching my yep. body to help generate all those, that creative principle of being alive. Yeah. And as you say, the importance of a sort of gentle, nurturing, caring practitioner seems to go a long way, no matter, you know, if they were um, doing crossword puzzles with you or, you know, prodding you in whatever energy meridians they think exist or whatever. That seems to be a key piece. Um, I think we're going to say that relationship is one of the foundations. Yeah. You know, you look at the longest term studies of what people do 
do stay healthy. Very clearly, movement is one of them, and very clearly, social interaction mm -hmm. is another one. Much better, actually, than food and um, brain gym. It's sort of movement is a great predictor of you staying healthy. Uh -huh. I would offer from trauma research, not dissociating is going to be part of that. So the ability to actually feel your body and not float off. But that doesn't emerge so much in the literature because people don't research dissociation in that way. But I think movement and social interaction, mm -hmm. the sense of being seen, met, supported by other people, I think that emerges very clearly as, as uh, two things that are very uh, predictive of people being healthy, happy, free, pain-free into old age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. As social animals, we need that social engagement and interactive trauma, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, you've mentioned a number of times sort of one of the buzzwords of our time, which is safety. Now, this word didn't exist as a feeling until about five years ago. I literally, I'd never heard anyone in my life describe themselves, say they feel safe as a sort of emotional state until, until about five years ago. Now, maybe in California it was 10, but it certainly wasn't in the normal lexicon of English feelings, as a, like angry or sad or you know normal emotions that people would talk about. And it seems to have shot to prominence as the most important thing in the world. And if someone doesn't feel safe, there's almost an implicit accusation sometimes in that. And um, yeah, I don't really know what people mean when they talk about this. Yeah, I, I'm going to offer, I think it's probably emerged from the deeper understanding of trauma. So the latest incarnation is the Me Too movement, but there's been understanding from the Vietnam War, the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder, the understanding mm -hmm. of child mm -hmm. sexual abuse, the understanding of adverse childhood experiences, the understanding of sexual abuse in the, the sort of uh, wider population. So I think safety is part of that conversation in response to our understanding of how often people get overwhelmed by people abusing power over them. So that would be a first statement from that. And then really, I, I would offer and frequently say there's two basic decisions your brain is making. Am I safe? So, uh, and uh, do I have enough resources to respond to this? I want you to think of like being on a, in a, uh, on a sunny day and you're sitting in a deck chair, but you've forgotten your sun cream and you've forgotten your sun hat. So there's a point when you're sitting in that chair where your skin's getting hot. And mm. depending, you know, in the 1970s, you weren't worried about that at all. Getting brown and really, really uh, wrinkly in the future wasn't really on the horizon in the 70s. Everyone wanted to be brown, brown, brown. So you'd have stayed in that chair longer because you didn't have the danger messages associated with it. Mm. Even though the stimulus was the same, it was still hot. Nowadays, we're much more scared. You see all these pictures of melanomas and... Uh, and there's much more literature around the danger of heat. But anyway, you're sitting in the chair, the temperature's going up, your brain is saying this isn't safe anymore from the internal experience of heat and the messages you have from your context. And at some stage, you're going to say, this is so dangerous, I need to go and get some um, sun cream or need to go and get a hat. But that depends on how much sugar, how much resources you have inside of you. And I'm going to offer that basic set of processes is going mm. on in a human being all the time. So, so let me let me understand this a bit better because I do appreciate that people are pointing to something important, but I'm I'm concerned about the language exactly around it. So it's partly an assessment, as you say. Some in the '70s would have a different cognitive assessment based on different facts, but then there's also partly a, a feeling, and in this case, it's the sun getting too hot the skin kind of starting to roast a bit and someone go, well, hang on, I feel a bit dehydrated maybe, you know, what's going on here? And that enables people, that um, encourages people to act. So depending on how resourced they are, they then at some point will jump into action. Yeah, exactly. And I think very much this notion of feeling states as drivers of brain activity is very important. And there's very good science around that. So Bud Craig talking about interioception our ability to assess the homeostasis, all the activity going on inside of us. And he's mapped out how we do that. And he's also mapped out in the brain how that interacts with the threat detection systems. We all have an inner guard dog. It's assessing the outside world. It's affected by our thinking and memories. And it's affected by the physiological state inside of me, whether my heart's beating too quick or my gut's churning or whatever. We integrate all that information, our thoughts, the information from the outside and the environment and the feelings inside of me. And we assess that, uh, do I have enough sugar to respond to my perception of threat right now? And that's the root driver of all human behavior Bud Craig offers and, and many others, but 
that those physiological processes out of that then emerges complex responses such as emotions, thoughts, and memories. But really, it's founded on our readout of our physiological state right now. So physiology drives feeling, drives human behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And is that different from like a fight flight response or an anxiety response? Like that's, there's something different in saying, because sometimes when I, someone says to me, they feel unsafe, it just looks like they're scared. Well, same, same, really. Um, I'm going to offer that. So uh, we're deciding how much should we have and whether it's safe or not. And if our response is that it's unsafe, then we generate certain principles of behavior. One of them is mobilizing. So we start to go very, very quick. And that's often colloquially called fight or flight. But it's a sense I'm going to speed up to adapt to this situation. And the other principle that not enough people know about is freeze or dissociation, where we immobilize, if we follow the language of Stephen Porges, we switch off in response to the, the perception of threat. So it's like playing dead, we're collapsing, or passive responses to what's going on. And uh, that has a light, that has a value. There's lots of pictures of animals who survive by um, playing dead. So a, a cheetah grabs a, um, a gazelle, the gazelle, gazelle plays dead, the cheetah gets distracted, the gazelle can run off. So the death feigning, switching off, collapsing, immobilizing, or going quick, mobilizing, are our two most basic responses that underpin all human consciousness, really, in response to, am I safe or not? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is Stephen Porges, the two sort of branches of the vagus nerve, isn't it, that kind of became famous for this um, dorsal and ventral, if I remember from your class correctly. and. Uh, the ventral vagal isn't that the new one so I'm kind of that's the one which is the the newer response as opposed to the dorsal vagal which is this old have I got this yeah. right shut shut no, you've got it absolutely right so um, the autonomic nervous system are these sort of background systems that run our physiology heart rate, blood flow sugar balance all those sorts of things and classically it was seen as a, a seesaw the uh, fight or flight response at extreme would also be sympathetics going quick, or we'd have the parasympathetics, which would be rest and digest. But there was a paradox here, rest and digest. If we turn that system on, we could also go into collapse and death feigning. And Paul just solved that conundrum. In the parasympathetics, there's actually two control centers, a new one or a ventral vagal control system. And that's uh, particularly well developed in humans and primates. And then we have this old dorsal vagal that all mammals have, all reptiles have actually, where we switch off all our vegetative systems, we appear to be playing dead. So Porges offered that we, in extreme circumstances, we immobilize. We also, sorry, in extreme most circumstance, the most extreme circumstances, inescapable threat. There's no escape, we immobilize. If we still think there's an escape route and we're very focused on that, we're mobilized, he adds in another phase of uh, checking what's going on and assessing how you're going, a ventral vagal state, where we, he calls it social engagement or orienting. So the orienting phase, we'd be checking what other human beings are doing, we'd be looking around the room. If we see safety, and as a therapist, we really need to know about this orienting phase because if I'm safe, my client, if I am a therapist, I'm safe. My client looks at me, sees that I think that we can cope with this pain or this distressing situation. They'll feed off me. They'll orient to me. Their ventral vagal system will connect and they'll begin to resonate with me and switch off their emerging stress response. So there's a bit of stress. We might kind of turn to our friend and look at them. And if they look sort of calm and supportive and caring, we go, okay, we chill out social monkeys we're all good we're co-regulating each other or in the case of a therapist they're doing most of the regulation right the, Beautifully they're, put, yeah. they're doing the heavy lifting as it were emotionally but you know they're both regulating and then a bit more stress we might go into fight or flight so it's like okay i'm not gonna be able to, i'm not gonna be able to love my way out of this one you know it's uh it's 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 one of those two responses if i can deal with it it's fight if i just try to get away that's flight which is maybe the less dangerous one actually isn't it running away and uh, we were just in a martial arts class yesterday and we were saying if someone has a knife first thing run away fighting's like the absolute kind of like the last resort because you're going to get cut you know so it's safer to run away and then if that doesn't work if you get caught then we play dead every human being if you squeeze them hard enough will do that um uh, dissociative 
uh, immobilizing response. Uh, right. Just to say, the I, I really like Paul just because instead of using fight or flight, he just says we mobilize, we speed up yeah. in the response. Yeah. Okay. Why people going to fight, why people going to flight is really unclear in the literature. So it's probably a learned response uh, uh, from your social history, maybe a little bit gendered, but um, some people fight, some people fly, but they're mobilizing is the better principle, I think. They're speeding okay. up to respond to this. Right, and, and if that doesn't work, people go into this catastrophic, real shutdown. This might be the soldier freezing. It might be the, the sexual assault victim freezing. You know, people might feel guilty about this. They don't understand it, but this is a biological response. And as a, as a martial arts teacher, I've seen this, that you put enough pressure on someone, eventually they freeze up. Like exactly. I've seen this time and time again. And a lot of what martial arts is, is training out these responses so that your tolerance and intelligent martial arts, martial art or intelligent martial arts teacher is increasing the range you can handle before you go into fight or flight and then increasing the range again before you go into freeze because they're not that adaptive. I love that. But, but also I find that that's my clinical work. Uh -huh. So I would offer that I've never met someone in anxiety or never met someone in, in persistent pain who isn't dissociating to some extent. In fact, I go so far as to say that most people dissociate most of the time. Uh, the opposite of dissociation is being grounded in our body, be able to be coherent with what's happening inside me and be present in the outside world. So I think we can always do more of that. And I think the inability to feel our bodies um, I'm going to frame as some element of dissociation and is the common theme in my clinical practice that we are disconnected from our bodies and that by connecting to our bodies, we switch off those stress responses you've just described. And exactly the same way in an extreme stance of training someone in a fighting situation to stay more present, our job actually is we have to train people to be present to daily life because at some stage, the stimulus of life or the history of disappearing because something very difficult happened in the past is kind of stuck in their physiology and their physiologies and their threat detection systems are miss, uh, not assessing the world in a way that is helping them uh, work effectively. So it's exactly the same principle you described, but I'm realizing that uh, people in persistent pain, people in anxiety, people who are just, life isn't as good as it should be, frequently they're in this uh, disconnected state they're switching on life and death reflexes on a daily basis and that's hard work yeah so i mean now it's the embodiment podcast right but i mean it's potentially a shocking statement to many listeners i can imagine like most people are disconnected from themselves most of the time we're not talking about necessarily people that have been in a you know a war or a sexual assault or something like that you're saying it's much more common than that absolutely i think it's uh um most people assuming being in a body is a given. It's actually not. It's really, really hard work. It's a discipline and a practice to really feel the size, shape, and weight of your body. And uh, I've learned uh, that it's really hard for people. Most people can't feel their own heartbeat. I find that quite shocking. But when right. I realized it, I asked, started asking every client for a couple of years, can you feel your heartbeat? I'd say a third of people could tune into their heartbeat when I asked them to. And actually, you look at the data, it's very hard to assess your own heartbeat. Most people get it quite wrong when they do that. So something as simple and as obvious as that, we've all felt our heartbeat running up some stairs or actually probably the heartbeat was one of your first interior receptive signals when you're in the um, uterus uh, being born, but it's still very, very difficult to know that. And I've learned that actually feeling and naming sensations inside you is a, a discipline and takes practice. And it's a skill that you can really develop. And the payoff of having the skill to do this is enormous. You have much more emotional granulation, much more nuance, much less likely to be alarmed by things. If you're good at feeling, instead of pain emerging, your body screaming at you, eight, nine out of 10, there's a problem here. You learn to pick up the ones and twos and threes and you take preventative action uh, much more uh, quickly and effectively and you learn to rest when you need to rest and you have these recovery times. Mm. So the sort of gifts of embodiment here, the gifts of tuning back in is one, that in itself is helpful, you know, just in terms of being in touch with ourselves, our own humanity. But but two, it reduces pain. So instead of getting to the needing an extreme signal, we're going, you know what, I'm a bit uncomfortable. I'm going to move, you know, like I just moving in my chair while I do these interviews. I can never sit still for an hour, you know. And um, or um, the third piece here is actually it reduces the this 
these different um, the stress responses as well, just just being tuned into the body. Yeah, I I just take I would take away the just. It's a really hard thing to consistently pay attention to your body, and yeah. it's a skill that most people undervalue. So if you only have two words for uh, how you feel, crappy or good, then you have two choices effectively. Uh-huh. And you just have really, really crap or really, really good. Yeah. If you can do 50 shades of crappy and 50 shades yeah. of good, you already have 100 choices for how you are. And if you have 500 words, then you have 500 choices for your state of being. And it's much more nuanced, creative, granulated. One of the theorists around this, Elizabeth Feldman Parrott, Elizabeth Feldman Barrett, one of the major authors around emotion right now, talks about the ability to granulate our experience, Uh uh find increasingly rich words for the feeling states inside of us, and that gives us more choice and is very predictive of health. Quick interruption to tell you about my book, Embodiment creatively named hey actually embodiment moving beyond mindfulness you can find this online at the embodimentbook.com that's the embodimentbook.com um so this book is an introduction to the whole field if you like these interviews you'll probably love this book um funny stuff poems personal stories from my life illustrating what embodiment is all about and loads for professionals in the field too Uh, top teaching tips language tips that kind of thing yeah, a real condensation of um, everything I've learned about embodiment, basically. Um, so you can get pre-orders at Amazon.com, and if you just put in embodiment moving beyond mindfulness, that's the name of the book, or go to theembodimentbook.com. On there, you'll see quotes from various teachers, a bunch of fun illustrations, and you can also get the first chapter completely free online at theembodimentbook.com. Enjoy, and back to the interview. Hang on, hang on. So, so I get the thing about more discernment and, you know, becoming the wine taster, you know, that has all the, yeah. the sort of discernment of different feeling states. How does that give us more choices? I mean, you could describe being fucked up in many different ways, but it like, how does that give more options in, in and of itself? Because it takes less sugar. If you've already got a word to describe or a phrase to describe this feeling state, your brain doesn't have to work as hard to sink into that state. So if I know what health feels like, then and I have a word or a phrase or a concept that allows me to uh, sink into that, then it happens much more quickly in the brain. So because I've learned it, there's already a sort of module that allows me to sink into it. So if I've practiced feeling yeah, relaxed or yeah. I've practiced a slow heartbeat or I've practiced uh, joyful breathing, mm-hmm. then and I can sort of name that to myself, then it's much easier for me to find that state. There's sort of a causal reaction between the concepts I apply to myself and my ability to sink into them. So the physiology changes. If I get good at naming that, I give it a label. uh, And then my label helps me find the state. And it's sort of a positive circle of naming and feeling, naming and feeling. The more I do that, the easier for it is to find the feeling states. Uh Similarly, if I've practiced naming the difficult states, I can recognize them and then move away from them. It doesn't take my brain as much sugar to work out what's going on. I've got more resources at that point of that could be just be suffering and just be alarming. So they're kind of reference points. And, and also the solutions are going to be different, right? If I don't know the difference between hungry and lonely and tired, I mean, you know, they've got three different solutions, right? If I'm hungry, I need to eat. If I'm lonely, I want to pick up the phone and call a friend. And if I'm tired, I need to rest. And no matter how much food I eat, it's not going to help me feel better rested or less lonely, right? beautifully put you know if all i feel in response to my heartbeat is anxiety then i will only be anxiety but maybe there's fear joy the sort of sense that it's a little bit anxious but also it's quite exciting and how do i differentiate those things but so many people every time their heart raises it's anxiety and they can't kind of reframe it another way or they can't learn to tolerate it or build resilience to that sensation and i'm offering part of that resilience building is the ability to label it differently Okay, interesting. Good stuff. Um, all right, so let's get into the TRE then. So this is how I know you. I've done the, the three-day course with you and I'm um, going to be doing another one fairly soon. Uh, I've been practicing the TRE regularly. We had um, David, is it, is it Baselli or Bacelli? It's Baselli, right? 
Uh, I say Baselli, uh, and that's how I've heard it. But uh, okay, I think uh, so. His is actually the most popular podcast out of two hundred and two episodes. It has the most listens. Um, though I, I, we just released one called Sex and Trauma, and that's the two most popular subjects put together. But um, so we'll have to see if that overtakes him. But um, it, it's it's this clearly an interest in trauma now. And David's well known in this field. So maybe you can say just people can refer back to his episode. He's very eloquent. But like just briefly, like what is the TRE method and why did you get interested in it? Yeah, David uh, did some visionary work around working in the Middle East and North Africa and sort of working around overwhelmed, traumatized communities. And uh, he trained as a psychologist, was in sort of communities about sort of uh, voluntary communities doing good, good works out there. And uh, quickly, this insight for him that trauma involves body responses. Uh, how can we help people as a community uh, meet their body? And he developed this sort of shaking paradigm. He studied uh, bioenergetics, which is from Alexander Lowen, which came out of uh, Reichian bodywork. So a sort of talking model that got into the body. But quickly, he just took the shaking element from uh, bioenergetics and sort of really levered that into a very simple practical tool very democratic and very low cost, which is huge around working with trauma. Because if you've been, there's an earthquake or a disaster or huge amount of people being uh, experiencing overwhelm, the Me Too movement, it's very hard to find enough therapists and very expensive to yeah, find right. work. Yeah, right. Totally. totally. This is David was really standout. about... Yeah. Sorry, go on. I just said this is a real standout point about TRE. It's the only thing that's scalable. And unless we're going to have, you know, being untraumatized as a middle class sort of elite privilege, something has to be scalable. Um, exactly. and I just haven't seen anything else. I've seen people try and do EMDR with groups, you know, but it, it seems to be the, the, the only one that currently exists of the, all these many great modalities that you can do pretty cheaply, which means you can actually, this is not a small thing, you know, poor oh, people can do it. You know, maybe that's just my values, but it strikes me as pretty essential. Yeah, no, and, and the idea that you can teach groups and community leaders to go and teach their communities to do this work is an important principle in TRE. And the idea that you can safely hold people in a process that meets their body and helps actually reboot some of the old physiological drives, helps us release tension and switch off the fight and flight process, or it helps us connect to our body and switch off the freeze process. Both of those, we believe, happen through shaking. So shaking as a releasing tension model, trauma releasing tension and trauma releasing exercises, but also really importantly, shaking is a way of generating new feelings, new signals inside you. So we might say TRE is a waking the body up process, inherently anti-dissociative, because we're generating new creative signals through the shaking process to help the mind and body engage and come out of stuck protective reflexes. Mm. Okay, so I mean, the, the basic theory to understand it is that people get stuck in this fight flight that can be uh, released through this this kind of shaking. And some people are in a more energy model of that. Some people don't necessarily need to have that kind of energetic model, as we discussed earlier. You know, sometimes it's called tension releasing, not trauma releasing, as well, right? That sometimes the T is one or the other. Um, you yeah. know, and uh, it's uh, you know, I've I've seen it seems to have a calming influence on people. Um, I mean, is that the basic sort of just the, the very basics of the theory of how it works? Yeah, you might say that something's happened to us. We contract as a way of surviving or bracing ourselves against life. Our brain gets stuck in this protective reflex of contracting. You might say we shake to release the tension and you're free to be healthier, happier than you were before. It's very hard work if your diaphragm's tight, your jaw is tight, your big pelvic muscles are tight. If they loosen up, that's a very simple tool for promoting health. So that releasing metaphor is very powerful. I do really want to stress the connecting metaphor, though. Mm -hmm. The idea mm -hmm. that shaking helps us learn to, to meet our body in a novel and exciting way. It's a creative stimulus to a stuck organism. So by shaking, we generate new feelings inside of us. And a previous part of our debate is the value of exploring new feelings and slowly meeting them and realizing all these emotions, all these things inside of me, I can negotiate them, I can learn to be with them, I can turn them on, turn them off. So a very important part of the shaking actually is learning to shake this natural reflex that we've lost touch with. We don't shake because we're traumatized, we shake because it's a natural reflex for optimizing the control in our body. 
But when we're shaking, you get a huge burst of afferent information, huge burst of new information moving through the system. And by how we pay attention to that and how we feel able to move towards, move away that information, and importantly, learning to switch off the shakes when we need to, gives us a huge sense of agency and control over our body and helps us feel more resilient in difficult times. You know, that time we walk into our boss, boss's office and we feel our body shaking, our heart beating quickly. I know that because I've practiced it and it's actually safe and I know that I can kind of interact with this without getting overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, obviously I'm a fan or else I wouldn't be, you know, coming to work with you. I wouldn't be doing it regularly myself. Um, and there's, you know, there's some criticism. So I think it's fair that we come to those. Um, I, f- I think the trauma world is maturing in the no one knew what trauma was a few years ago. You know, I'd be find myself just happened to be my Aikido teacher was a trauma expert, Paul Linden. So I knew a little bit about it. Other than that, though, I was like, it wasn't really a thing. Whereas now it's becoming much more widespread in society. And, and an issue is that all the trauma schools are effectively financially competitive. They, um, people are in heavily invested in approaches. And that's not to say anything to do with I Very much when I see Pete Levine or David or any of the people that have invented schools, they all look sincere to me. They all look genuine. I'm not saying any of them are hucksters or anything like that they all look really sincere and wanting to help people the ones i've come across certainly and it's very difficult to get a a sort of objective information because people are like you you teach a certain school irene lyons we've had on great podcast she teaches for a particular school you know uh betsy politin she teaches for a particular school these are all people we've had on the podcast so we f- i find something quite a difficult situation where now there's sometimes competing claims someone might say this could be re-traumatizing or that's only good for shock therapy sorry for shock trauma uh it's only you know the thing with the polar bear video i've seen taken apart where there's the thing with the polar bear shaking and someone said well that was only the completion of its um running because it was darted while running it wasn't to do with any kind of trauma shaking um you know i've had paul linden one of my trauma one of my own trauma teachers say well i've never seen shaking in people where on earth did this come from this idea um so what do we do in this sort of mess of competing claims and schools well, first off, I mean, uh, we, we spoke earlier on the different principles in cranial work or chiropractic or physiotherapy. So first off, community is always attached to their way of doing it. So I'm going to say that's the normal future yeah. of any community that's yeah. working. Two, trauma is very complex. So it's always going to be a huge range of solutions. The best science uh, is always multifactorial and appreciates there's lots and lots of causes. But also that means there's lots and lots of levers we can work on. So we might translate from pain that there's a biopsychosocial model of pain where pain emerges or uh, lack of health emerges from a complex mix of your biology. So chemicals aren't being produced, the muscles are overstretched, joints might be in a particular way. Uh, society, what your family thought, what your um, uh, church felt, you know, what the people around you believe around pain is also deeply real biopsychosocial, and your beliefs around what pain is or isn't are also deeply relevant. So pain is always multifactorial. So I'm going to say trauma and anxiety, exactly the same thing. It's always multifactorial. So some people are focusing more on talking and changing beliefs, and that's valid work. It makes a contribution. TRE's routine is not necessarily about changing beliefs and exploring that. It's more we're working with the physiology, and that's our primary entry point into the wholeness of a human being doesn't devalidate the other approaches. It's just celebrating one particular way of doing it. You'll notice, I mean, Irene Lyons is pretty cool, but she's very easy to criticize other things. TRE, we don't do that. We're not sort of saying ours is better or worse. We're just saying, let's pay attention to tremors. David's written a lovely article with four neuroscientists talking about how the science of tremors and how it's been understood. We do know that tremoring is a feature of how the brain and body interact. So if you stand on one leg, you're going to shake. There's central pattern governors, little neurons in the spinal cord that fundamentally control muscles by oscillating. So walking is controlled shaking. Standing is controlled shaking. When you reach for a glass of water, then you wobble your way to that glass of water. We know this because 5% of the population has these benign postural tremors 
that have no predictive value around disease, but are just a function. And luckily, genetically, they're not very good at smoothing out that natural oscillation. So the literature is very, very clear that central pattern governors are modulated by a higher brain to regulate muscle activity. What we're doing is we're letting those central pattern governors run the body, set up a shaking process on the floor. And our experience is that this burst of movement information is a novel stimulus to a stuck organism. And like any stimulus, if you approach it with curiosity, if you approach it with safety, it can promote learning and new growth in that organism. And that's very, very simple and very clean, I would offer as a paradigm. So is that helpful to start with? Yeah, yeah, this is all good. It's all good. And I, you know, it's kind of almost like kind of right to reply, you know, because Irene's been, I like Irene a lot. I like her work and she's been fairly vocal about sort of don't do this, don't do that. And and uh, I feel like there should be a sort of right to reply almost, you know? Yeah, I, well, I, I, uh, I don't know. I don't really read her stuff. I've just seen it around a little bit. But the what we're doing here is um, providing, I think there's three things going on in TRE. One, there's the novel stimulus of shaking. So novelty is very useful and safe stimuli done in a novel, creative, interesting, safe way do change how an organism works. Two, we're also educating people around trauma. So we're teaching people they're not mad, bad and broken. We're teaching people that trauma is a normal physiological response to extraordinary circumstances. If you understand fight or flight and mobilizing, if you understand dissociation, that's a huge gift to a human being. And just jump in there, like that sort of basic psychoeducation, whether it comes from you guys or, you know, you, you little books you write are fantastic. I really would recommend those little books with the cartoons in to people, listeners, I'm sure can find them online. We'll tell them where at the end. Or, you know, do Irene Lyons' basic intro course or read one of Paul Linden's books if you're an Aikido teacher on trauma. And it's like just that psychoeducation makes people go, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not a bad person, you know, and I'm not permanently done. It's not like this is it now. And just that psychoeducation without even any treatment is a big deal, right? Huge. Absolutely huge. I'd say at least a third of the value of a TRE class is we yeah. talk people around what's happening in their basic physiology and trying to try and find simple metaphors that can help them understand you're not mad, bad or broken. The third big element is this training in mind-body interaction, and that's what we've talked about a little bit, helping people find new words for sensations, helping people find detail and granulation, and realize that paying attention to how you feel, training yourself in mind-body interaction, learning about control and letting go, learning about celebrating and that you can be with intense feeling inside you and not get overwhelmed is also a huge part of the TRE process. So the pure joy of shaking is a novel stimulus, learning about trauma and what that involves, and learning how to pay attention to sensations, learning about mind-body interaction. All of those, I think, are equally weighted within the TRE process and all support new growth. Because trauma is so complex and because it's so early, people need a variety of tools. I've worked with people with complex developmental trauma who've experienced horrible, horrible things and they found TRE really, really safe and useful. I've worked with people who've got minor stress problems and they hate talking about things. They love the fact they can go to a class, yeah, not yeah. talk about anything, do a simple embodied practice. However, those limitations or those features of TRE aren't going to work for everybody. Yeah. Just in the way that a one-to-one -one therapeutic relationship isn't going to work for everybody. People need different things at different times in their life. Yeah. absolutely recognize that in trauma, some people have very complex needs and they're going to benefit from a range of tools. They're going to need some form of embodiment, whether that's Qigong or movement, TRE as a practice or yoga. They're going to need good meds. They're going to need a psychiatrist to really regulate them. Sometimes they're going to need a community and it might be really good to have a one-to-one -one talking relationship that helps them and holds them. All of those things are being useful. We're simply making a plea that the body isn't featured typically in many first-line responses to therapy. Cognitive yeah. behavioral therapy, EMDR are recommended in the UK in our frontline treatments, but mostly you're going to get uh, referred to a psychiatrist and they're going to be offering medication, and they really wouldn't have a theory around why the body is, is a useful tool in working with trauma, and we would say the body is a primary place to operate to help people down-regulate physiology so their thinking and thoughts can change. And that's our simple, passionate claim, really, that by connecting to the body, 
you can down-regulate these uh, physiological responses that are hijacking you and affecting how you think and feel and yeah, sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, it's very interesting when you start to hear data or stories from people because it's this real bias, isn't there? It's like this selection bias who comes to you, you know, like this selection bias and who you're able to have access to who can afford you. Uh, and then there's every, every therapist has good stories about people that were helped by them, but would they have got better anyway? We don't know, right? There's literally no way of telling. There's a return to the norm for sure. So most people will get better uh, but they get a therapy during that process and they attribute it to the therapy. We, we, we do know that, yes. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, I think this idea of just saying, you know what, different things work for different people at different times, it's complicated. There's, you know, anyone who's selling a one, I say this to any listeners, anyone who's selling a sort of one, one shot is the answer to everything. Everyone has to do yoga. Everyone has to do this kind of qigong, whatever. Be suspicious of that, right? Like, particularly if they're financially invested in that one approach. Yeah, and I'm going to say uh, our intentional things are connecting to the body and finding safety inside you. That's po- probably one of our baselines, really. But again, you know, that's negotiable. Some people, if you look, Byron Katie is doing no body intensive. Deepak Chowdhury says it's all vibration and energy and your body is a fiction. So my paradigm of connecting to the body, there are diametrically opposite ways of working with that where it's all about concepts. For me, just because you can change concepts and that has an effect on the person, it doesn't follow that there are only concepts. People attach that biopsychosocial model, they attach to psychology and beliefs. They think because they can change beliefs, there are only beliefs. That's a misreading of the situation, really. It's much more complex than that. Yeah, yeah. I think we can all agree that Deepak Chopra is full of shit, though. I mean, I think that's one thing we can all get together on. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's one flag we can all sail under, you know? But um, I, the, he was universally rejected from being given an invitation to the embodiment conference. Uh, I put it to the Facebook group, and uh, after about 20 people had said no, I was like, okay, guys, chill out, all right. <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, as I said, bit, I'm suspicious of any approaches which say we need to sort of somehow transcend that, including the body. But uh, maybe I've mischaracterized it. Who knows? The well, I really, we just need to own our bias, don't we? Uh, for me, yeah. uh, there is a body. It's a real thing. My philosophy starts with there's a real world and an accident of consciousness inside me. And that has certain consequences. But also, we need to know that is not the dominant paradigm in the world. Most people do believe in an energetic, extended consciousness model. And health is about vibrating in a particular way or nurturing my eternal soul and my body is temporary here and we're playing a much longer game Uh and any big misunderstandings around trauma you want to clear up Uh, the most common ones you hear in workshops because everyone's a trauma expert now and um you know it's uh, i'm sure you're meeting both better educated students but also kind of people kind of having weird um, views. Mostly to really emphasize it's not a life sentence. So initially when the diagnosis came out, it became a little bit of a victim culture and this has happened. Uh-huh. My brain has changed. I can't change it. It's, we're deeply, deeply malleable and deeply have this capacity to low and grow, low and uh, grow and learn. And really beautiful research is that 30 to 70%, depending on which studies you look at, of people who go through an overwhelming event, for example, the death of a loved one, a sudden death of a loved one, within six months they define themselves as happier and life having more meaning because they've grown after the event. So most human beings, 30 to 70%, depending on very robust long-term studies, actually grow after roaming of roaming events and appreciate life more. They've changed, they're different, but the consequence of that is life has more meaning. And that's a great tool to realize. One of the things that got me into David was we wouldn't be alive as a human species unless we'd learned to be more resilient, unless we'd learned to overcome trauma, transcend it and grow from it. And that's actually a fundamental feature of the human experience. And actually the data really backs that up. So whatever's happened to you, the idea that you can reconnect to joy and feelings of ease inside of you seems to be a genetic feature and something that we would strongly encourage as possible. So yeah, that very hopeful message that uh, even the scariest thing that's happened to you, people can transcend, can grow, can learn. You'll be different for sure, but by finding safety and using your body, that's a very powerful tool to help you come out of those stuck, dark, difficult places.
Yeah. I'd love to see like a conservative contribution to trauma awareness in that what I see happening is the trauma awareness is even non-existent, which is your standard conservative point of view, um, which case it's like, you know, man up, you're weak, you know, get over it. Or there's a sort of extreme liberal kind of sensitivity victim culture. And I wonder what happens when the, the trauma education, which is now wonderfully happening around the world, gets truly integrated and sort of both ends of that spectrum are kind of uh, talked about, both the resilience and the stoicism that we get from the right and also the sort of sensitivity and consideration that we get from the left. Um, I have, I've yet to see an approach which truly integrates those two. Uh, yes, me neither. I'm, I haven't got much to say to that one. I, I think one thing that's important to realize is a lot of trauma work is focused on individuals finding self-empowerment, and that's yeah. really important. Yeah. If we're empowering people to live in an unjust world, then is that really supporting anybody? At some stage, what we need to change is social justice and help people find rights. So the idea that communities get more resilient and then campaign for change uh, is um, is also a feature that's not really talked about enough in trauma circles, I would uh-huh. So moving away from individual uh, model. Uh, there's a resilience toolkit. Enkem Edifedo is coming to the UK. She's an ex-TRE person, someone a very good friend of mine, and uh, huge respect for her. And for her, this notion of social justice is very much a theme of her teaching and her work. Uh, maybe I should look you two up in case you want to chat to her. But um, she's she's very uh, she's very good on this point that it's not just about changing individuals and helping people. If we help people be strong in an unjust world, but they're not changing the world, then we're kind of missing a point here. Yeah, yeah, it could be a sort of balm for just coping with injustice and various things. I certainly have my concerns about the social justice movement, as it often seems to be around some kind of reward, uh, group reward or group punishment, which I don't agree with. But just in terms of just generally a concern for uh, group well-being and realising there's more to it, you know, the sort of... um, uh, Gabo and Mate stuff about how we're not just alone as individuals. There's a bigger social picture that I can certainly relate to and not just using our, you know, yoga or meditation or trauma therapy or anything else as a way to sort of soothe people so they can cope with the fact that <laughs> the system's fucked. And <laughs> it needs to change. That's uh, yeah. Yeah, not such a good use of our skills. Maybe. Okay. Well, we need to move towards wrap up here. Um, actually, just have one, one last week. If you have another five minutes. Sure. One personal question. The social engagement system, is that itself a stress response or is it something that's another system that's not compatible with the stress response? I didn't quite understand how this is talked about by people. This is a, just a personal... Yeah, no, you, you have to be start being quite um, careful with the language or be very precise with your terms. Uh-huh. So um, it's a protective reflex. Let's think about it like that. It's one of the things human beings do as emerging threat comes into the environment. However, if uh, we perceive safety, if we orient and socially engage, we switch off the emerging stress response. So we might say, I'm happy, uh, let's do it with a mouse. There's a mouse, it's happy, it's eating cheese, life is full of possibilities. It's thinking about Mrs. Mouse when it goes home that evening, life is good. There's a smell or a noise and it turns its head, it orients, it's socially engaging, looking at what the other mouse are doing and it's checking if it's danger. So depending on what it perceives. If it perceives the environment is safe and it was just an innocuous noise, then it switches off its emerging stress response. However, if it sees that there is a whisker and it becomes a cat, then its stress response begins to get quicker and quicker. So it's a way of, um, uh, as the perception of threat increases, our social nervous system switches off and we transition into fight or flight and full on mobilizing. So if you like, it's the priming of the stress system or the process where we're releasing the brakes. And as we're releasing the brakes, we check brakes on the go quick principle. As we're releasing the brakes on that go quick principle, we're actually checking what's going on and do I really need to uh, adapt here. Okay, so so, yeah, so a primer for the acceleratory kind of part of the nervous system, but also it can be like, okay, everything's all right as a way not to go into fight or flight. Um, the acceleration part and also it seems that this sort of bait once people are in fight or flight they're out of the social right that they're, they're in an anti-social mode it's very difficult to relate and connect 
as if you've ever had a partner that's stuck in that fight flight system it's very hard yeah we're stuck i've got to do this and i've got to do it now because it's very fixed rigid thinking the kind of body's screaming do something do something go really quick and our thoughts get fixed you know i've got to get to that exit you get in my way then i'm just going to run over you because my body yeah. is screaming at me i will die if i don't do this yeah you should really remember these are life and death systems that we're switching on in daily circumstances and it's yeah. really hard work and it generates very poor choices and very fixed thinking for people yes it's not creative and it's not social they're sort of uh, yeah okay great so um in terms of finding out more about you where should people go steve if they want tre training in uh, london or elsewhere yeah no uh, tre college.com so that's tre college.com or also just general stuff in my book. So three comic books, Pain is Really Strange, Trauma is Really Strange, Anxiety is Really Strange. Anxiety book won an award last year, or highly recommended by the British Medical Association. So some nice stuff, short comics and introductions to you know those subjects. So you can access all those through bodycollege.net. So trecollege.com and bodycollege.net. And are they kind of Amazon as well, if people are on, on the... Yeah, you can just search for Steve Haynes on Amazon and you'll get the three books coming up. Or Is Really Strange is the little hook for all three books. Yeah, the the, the, the one I've got on trauma is just so accessible. It's got pictures of mice and various other things in. And I, I almost think it just, just should be required reading for anyone doing any kind of embodiment course at all. Because it's like you could read it in an hour easily. And um, it's got all the kind of key concepts we talked about in today, you know, and it's just sort of a nice introduction that's really accessible for people. So um, I think I'm probably going to put it on my course reading list next year because I was, I was thinking, what's the one book I want to read, I want to read on trauma? And the, the body keeps the score is good, but it's kind of heavy. It's a long read. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, Pete Levine's got a couple of good introductory ones, but they're from a particular perspective. And I think this is as good as a sort of introduction to anyone who's, Anyone who's not already a trauma therapist is out there who's a you know, yoga teacher or a keto teacher. It would be a pretty good place to start in terms of your trauma reading. No, I really appreciate that. Yeah, that, that, I mean, their books have been a very nice project and they've taken on a life of their own. They're in French, German, Chinese, Korean right now as a Spanish version. So, yeah, um, yeah it's been a really nice to see them grow and go out in the world and uh, keep getting good feedback, which is a huge um, thrill, actually. Steve, well, thanks for joining us today. Do you have a final message about the body for listeners? Yeah, keep feeling, keep feeling, keep feeling. <laughs> I like it. Simple message. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Bye-bye. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it. Um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites comments on there um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into Facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um, yeah I will reply to things personally there so um, also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and, of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop-up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. A bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.